The World of Dune, created by Frank Herbert, is a science fiction epic novel series that explores ecology and environmental issues, with a strong focus on the relationship between organisms and their environment. Our pet doesn't understand your language. Get out! The creatures of Dune are intimately connected in a vast ecosystem, and the story is rife with extensive lore on meticulously written characters and monsters. And today, we're here to talk about some of the most popular creatures in the Dune universe. So, let's jump right into it. Before we get into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. Number 1. The Hideous Spider Creature Denis Villeneuve's Dune film has been praised for its faithfulness to the source material, but it also introduced a new element that has intrigued many fans. A humanoid spider creature, referred to as our pet by Baron Harkonnen, made its debut in the film, leaving many fans scratching their heads as to its origins. The creature's appearance is a complete mystery, as it's not mentioned in the Dune books or in any previous adaptations. Some fans believe that the creature is a nod to the Harkonnen's notorious depravity, while others speculate that it may be a creation of the Bene Tleilax, a group known for their genetic experimentation. Another theory is that the creature is a tribute to the Tarantula Wolf, a creature from Alejandro Jodorowsky's comic book, The Meta Barons, which Villeneuve referenced in his first trailer for the film by using Pink Floyd's music. Despite its uncertain origins, the spider creature has made a significant impact on the film. VFX animator Robin Luckham designed the creature to reflect the twisted nature of the Harkonnens, drawing inspiration from insects such as the Black Widow Spider. The creature's humanoid form and elongated legs are both familiar and unnerving, and its glowing eyes add an extra layer of detail to its inherent eeriness. Number 2. Sandworm in the desolate and unforgiving terrain of Arrakis, there was a creature so feared and revered that it dominated the planet's ecology, the Sandworm. A natural-born predator from a mysterious and alien world, the Sandworm had existed on Arrakis for eons, long before the dawn of the Butlerian Jihad. It burrows deep beneath the parched surface, where it lay in wait, ever vigilant against intruders. The sandworm's acute senses detected any vibration on the surface, and they emerged with such speed and force that their victims had no chance of escaping. It was also key to the creation of the Spice Melange, the most coveted substance in the universe, and it played a vital role in Arrakis's ecosystem. Its very presence had transformed the barren landscape, giving rise to a diverse array of flora and fauna. The Fremen, a people native to the planet, had learned to coexist with the sandworm, and even even to ride it. One of the most fascinating things about the sandworm was its size, which could reach colossal proportions, with some individuals reported to be over 450 meters long. Its thick, orange-colored skin, composed of numerous interlocking scales, served as a natural armor, almost impenetrable to most weapons. However, the sandworm had a weakness. Its soft underbelly was susceptible to irritation from the sand. By prying open one or more of its scales, sand could enter the sandworm's body, causing extreme discomfort. The sandworm would roll itself to move the affected area to the highest point to reduce the amount of sand entering, and the Fremen would use this opportunity to mount and ride the creature with specialized hooks. The sandworm's diet consisted mostly of sand and inorganic materials from the Arrakis crust, which gave it a unique and distinct odor of cinnamon and flint. However, water was its mortal enemy. Even the smallest amount could prove fatal. When mixed with water, the sandworm would undergo an accelerated metabolic process that ultimately led to its violent and agonizing death. The byproduct of this deadly mixture was a highly toxic substance known as the Water of Life, which the Reverend Mothers of the Bene Gesserit utilized for their mystical purposes. The Sandworm's life cycle was a complex and intriguing process. It all started with the gathering of sand trout around a hidden store of water beneath the planet's surface. This mixture of sand trout and water was transformed into a liquid chemical that the sandworm could safely digest, allowing the surviving sand trout to complete their metamorphosis into young sandworms. The perpetuation of this process kept the cycle of life on Arrakis moving forward. Number 3. Face Dancer 
Bene Tulelax were responsible for the birth of many strange and fascinating creatures, one of them being the Face Dancers. These were a race of beings with the unique ability to take on the physical appearance of any individual, making them indispensable to Tleilaxu society. Their flesh would twist and contort, dancing as they changed their shape to mimic someone else. While they could take on the physical sex of the person they were copying, Face Dancers were neither male nor female and were incapable of breeding, but their talents were not without limitations. The pheromones they emitted could be detected by Bene Gesserit adepts, making them less effective against those with that particular skill. However, the Tleilaxu continued to develop and improve the talents of their face dancers, until they became nearly undetectable, even by the Bene Gesserit. These new face dancers were also capable of absorbing some of the memories of those they mimicked, making their impersonations even more convincing. But there was a danger to their abilities. If a face dancer stayed in a role for too long, they could become delusional losing touch with reality and believing themselves to be the person they were mimicking. This loss of control could expose the Tleilaxu's infiltration, making them vulnerable to their enemies. One such case was the Rakian chief priest Hedley Tuek, whose exposure threatened the very existence of the face dancer race. Number 4. Muad'Dib Muad'Dib is a name that carries great symbolism within the series. It is the name that Paul Atreides chooses when he is accepted as one of the Fremen, a desert-dwelling people on the planet Arrakis. The name has two meanings. The first, Yusul, is Paul's secret name, meaning strength of the base of the pillar, which only his troop may use. The second, Muad'Dib, is the name by which he is known openly taken from the small desert mouse that Paul saw foraging in the deep desert. The name is significant in that it reflects Paul's mastery of the desert, as the mouse is able to survive in harsh conditions, and also reflects his role as a teacher and instructor of the Fremen. Paul's choice of name is influenced by his prescient visions of the future, in which he sees throngs of Fremen chanting his name in subservience. The mouse shadow on the second moon is a small but significant detail that appears throughout the Dune series, reflecting the enduring legacy of Muad'Dib and his impact on the world of Arrakis. Number 5. Navigators The Spacing Guild is one of the most intriguing and enigmatic organizations in Frank Herbert's Dune universe. They hold a monopoly over space travel and the spice trade, which has granted them immense political and economic influence. The guild's ability to fold space and time, enabling instantaneous travel across the universe, combined with the ban on computing technology, adds depth and complexity to the story of Dune. The Spacing Guild's monopoly on interstellar travel is maintained by the Guild Navigators, who are the pilots of the colossal Guild Highliners through space. These navigators have elongated heads and extremities, and they give the appearance of being almost aquatic due to their atrophied and mutated bodies caused by the extensive ingestion and exposure to the spice melange. Prolonged exposure also leads to a change in the color of their eyes to a dark blue shade known as blue and blue or the eyes of the Abad, a common side effect in spice addicts. The inception of the spacing guilds can be attributed to Norma Senva, a brilliant mathematician who possessed incredible psychic abilities. However, the guild's real founder was Aurelius Venport, who was Senva's lover, and later she herself acknowledged him as the one who established it. Following the conclusion of the Butlerian Jihad, which was a violent uprising against intelligence machines, humanity underwent a period of reflection, and the void left by the absence of intelligent machines prompted the emergence of new orders, including the Mentats, the Bene Gesserit, and the Spacing Guild. The Guild played a significant role in establishing religious standardization by promoting the widespread use of the Orange Catholic Bible. Although the Guild leadership were atheists, they recognized the value of a stable and organized religious system, which could provide social cohesion and foster economic stability. In this way, the Guild was able to maintain its influence and profit from the stable societal order that the widespread adoption of the Orange Catholic Bible helped to establish. Instead of directly seizing power, the Spacing Guild preferred to wield their influence from the shadows and share power with the ruling emperor and noble houses. This strategy stemmed from their belief that all political empires eventually collapse, and they must ensure their continued existence by acting as a parasite, supporting one imperial dynasty until it falls, and then switching allegiance to the next. 
Number 6. D-Wolves D-Wolves are no ordinary wolves, but genetically engineered creatures created by Leto II as hunters and guardians of his career. Their physical appearance is as impressive as their purpose. These grey beasts are almost as tall as a man at the shoulders, making them formidable and imposing. Their keen eyesight, inherited from gaze hounds, allows them to detect intruders from afar and track them down relentlessly. Leto II had to start somewhere in creating these beasts, so he imported wolves from a dozen different worlds known for their hunting abilities, speed, size, and endurance. He then crossbred them with gaze hounds, resulting in a new species of wolf that excels at sight hunting and is less dependent on scent tracking. This makes them a formidable predator, able to catch their human prey without relying on their scent. To create the largest and most imposing wolves, Leto II selectively bred the largest individuals and incorporated them back into the mix. As a result, by the end of the first half century of the program, he had produced wolves that dwarfed all other known species. These beasts are physically imposing and designed to strike fear into the hearts of intruders. Siona Atreides, one of the few to have encountered D-Wolves, describes them as ruthless hunters with a taste for flesh. They are allowed to eat anything they hunt in the Forbidden Forest, which serves as their hunting ground. These creatures are conditioned to stop pursuing intruders at the water's edge of the Idaho River, marking the boundary of their territory. Number 7. The Living Axolotl Tanks The Axolotl Tank is a unique technology in the Dune universe, introduced by the Bene Tlaxu, who had a knack for genetic engineering. They have the ability to generate human beings using cells extracted from corpses. They were originally invented to produce Golas and also face dancers, but the technology was kept secret until the Great Scattering. They also tried to use the tanks to create an artificial version of Melange, but the experiment failed and the project got shut down. According to the books, the tanks had a rather disturbing origin. They were grown from the wombs of Tleilaxu women, who were left in a vegetative state. The tanks themselves were massive structures with bright lights and mechanical appendages that resembled padded hands. At the center of the tank was a woman connected to the metal container through numerous dark tubes that encircled her body. The image of the woman, almost completely engulfed by the machinery and technology that sustained her life, was a haunting sight that left a lasting impression on Duncan Idaho, who witnessed it countless times. The tanks were capable of genetic altering, making it possible to add wanted traits like faster reflexes into an individual. The Tleilaxu used the technology to create Golas, which are clones of dead people that could retain the original's memories and skills. For a very long time, prior to the events in Heretics of Dune, the Bene Gesserit held the belief that the axolotl tanks housed the Tleilaxu women. However, it wasn't until a Duncan Idaho Gola was reborn from the tank that the truth was revealed. The tanks were capable of producing human flesh, a realization that shattered their previous assumptions. And so the Gesserit acquired the information on the workings of the tank and used it to make their own Golas. They never really revealed the detailed process of how they created Golas, because the technology was a heavily guarded secret of the Tleilaxu. Hate, the first son of Duncan Idaho's Golas, was briefly referenced in Dune Messiah as originating from the Axolotl tank, and he was gifted to Paul Atreides, despite being aware that Hate was designed to kill Paul. He still accepted him as a gift, and later he became one of his most valuable and trusted companions during his reign. Also, after Leto II became the God Emperor, he ordered the Tleilaxu to create Golas of Duncan Idaho. And if you want to know more about this, check out our video on the infamous tyrant worm God of Dune, Leto Atreides II. Number 8. Golas. We've talked about the axolotl tanks, which are the source of Golas, but what exactly are Golas? You might be thinking that they are basically clones of dead people, but that's where you're wrong. Unlike clones, which were created from cells taken while the original human was still alive, Golas required cells collected only after the human's death. This condition was essential to ensure that the Gola possessed most of the memories of the source human, thanks to a combination of conditioning and genetic memory. Initially, Golas were created to offer comfort to the grieving families of the deceased. However, the Golas had no memories of their original lives, which limited the solace they could offer. The Bene Tleilax, who specialized in creating Golas, theorized that it was possible to reawaken a Gola's original memories based on the concept of genetic memory. Evidence suggested that Golas could experience echoes of their past lives, such as feelings stirred up from sounds or smells. 
To test this theory, the Tleilaxu provided Muad'Dib with a Gola of Duncan, Idaho, named Hate. Although he possessed none of his original memories, the Tleilaxu conditioned Hate to assassinate Muad'Dib. However, the psychological trauma caused by the paradox between his innate love for the Atreides and his conditioning caused Idaho's memories to emerge, proving the theory correct. After that, a similar process was used to reawaken pre-Gola memories. As time passed, Golas played an increasingly important role in the universe, especially especially during the reign of Emperor Paul Atreides. Duncan Idaho was replicated as a Gola countless times over several thousand years, with each iteration possessing some deep-seated conditioning intended to assist the Tleilaxu in their political and cultural endeavors. Miles Tegg was also replicated once by the Bene Gesserit shortly before the arrival of the Matres, using the same method as Gola's, except that he was a clone due to the cells being taken before the original Tegg's death. Physically, Golas appeared no different from regular humans, except for their initially artificial metallic eyes, which were later resolved to have natural eyes like the source human. They were physically identical to the original being they were replicated from, adding to their value as perfect clones with the original memories, and in some cases, additional conditioning. Number 9. Cymec. Cymecs are a terrifying creation in the Dune prequel universe, representing the fusion of humans and machines. Their physical appearance is as intimidating as it is magnificent, with massive robotic bodies that are fearsome and weaponized. There is no mistaking their power and dominance over the weaker human beings. Despite the fact that they were once human, Cymex are considered to be superior and natural overlords of humans. This mindset is reflected in their use of derogatory terms like Hrethgir when referring to humans. This superiority is also evident in their robotic bodies, which are more advanced and powerful than anything a human could ever hope to possess. The preservation canister containing the organic brain of a Cymex is the only remnant of their humanity. The canister is filled with electrofluid, which allows the brain to remain functional for tens of thousands of years with proper upkeep. It is through Thoughtrodes that the brain controls the interchangeable robotic bodies, ensuring that the Cymex remains a formidable force to be reckoned with. There are two categories of Cymex, Titans and neo -Cymex. The Titans were the original 20 humans who conquered and ruled the old empire until the rise of Omnius. It is unclear how many of them became Cymex and who died as humans, whereas neo -Cymex are all Cymex that came after the establishment of the 20 Titans. One of the most significant strengths of the Cymex is also their major weakness. The ability to detach from their robotic bodies leaves them vulnerable to numerous forms of manipulation. This vulnerability is often exploited by their new masters, either Omnius or the Titans, and newly created Cymex are often indoctrinated into total subservience. In Mentats of Dune, a new group of Cymex is created by the human Dr. Ptolemy using the brains of failed guild navigators. These Cymex are more advanced than their predecessors, and are funded by Joseph Venport as a counter to Manford Torondo and his fanatical mobs of anti-technology Balerians. Despite their advanced capabilities, the team of Cymex is ultimately destroyed after managing to obliterate a sandworm on Arrakis. Conclusion the creatures of Dune, be they sandworms or genetically mutated humans, weren't just terrifyingly magnificent because of their size and form, but also because each character was intricately woven into the delicate balance of ecology on the harsh planet of Arrakis. The sandworms, in particular, played a crucial role in the survival of the Dune universe, and the exploitation of their excretions has caused ecological havoc on the planet. The Fremen's deep respect for the sandworms and their careful movements across the desert highlighted the delicate relationship between the creatures and the native people. Frank Herbert created these creatures to serve as a warning about the consequences of ecological abuse and the importance of preserving the delicate balance of nature. That's all for now, and we hope you found today's video entertaining. If you're interested in seeing more content related to Dune, please feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section below. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. This has been Corey Whelan for Marvelous Videos. Have a good one, be safe out there, and thanks for watching.